The Lakers took the Warriors crowd completely out of the game early, as I tweeted out, had them glitching almost like it was a 2K game chanting defense when the dubs were on offense, as it was almost like the Golden State Warriors were playing a road game, and we know they don't play too well in those scenarios, having finished 11-30 during the regular season away from Chase. Offensively and on the glass, Anthony Davis was the star of the show for Hollywood's top team. 30 points and 23 rebounds for the brow made him a definitively beastly presence, unlike anything Kevon Looney has ever seen or dealt with in the past, maybe throughout his entire postseason career. This right here, this is AD's perfect somewhere. Why are you whispering? Because I got self-conscious. For the Dubs, dropping Game 1 entails Wardell Stephen Curry II will have to carry his team against a fresh-minded Laker coach defensive system who, quite frankly, seem to have him sought out, which we'll get to coming up, to at least one road win if their season's going to extend past Round 2. Massive concern if you're a diehard Warrior fan is the fact that Golden State got a good night from Steph, albeit it being a quiet 27 points. They had three 20-plus point scores, five players scoring in double figures, yet other than a 14-0 run down the stretch, which was actually responded to nicely by the Lakers in the final few minutes, it seemed like LA had control of this one the entire night. Don't get it twisted, beating the Warriors three more times over the next potentially six games will be a very, very tough challenge for the Lakers. But Jared Vanderbilt was just seemingly the most bothersome Stephen Curry defender we've maybe ever seen. Living up to the hype we put into him right after he was traded to the Lakers, the length from Vando was evidently bothersome for Curry. Additionally, the game's second MVP trophy on the defensive end for LA in this one was Dennis Schroeder, whose Matthew Dellavedova-esque screen navigation and one-on-one -on -one peskiness provided Curry with a different bothersome look. Schroeder was an elite mix with the Vandalorian in terms of making everything tough on the chef, but Laker Nation if you have to give credit to one man after this brilliant performance to open up the Western Conference semifinals, it's Mr. Vanderbilt. It was an off night shooting the basketball from Steph in general, as he made just 10 of his 24 shots overall, but it was a drastically more tough of a night for him when he was specifically guarded by Vanderclamps. When guarded by Vanderbilt, Steph shot just 2 for 10 from the field, 1 of 5 from deep, equating to an insane 92% contested shooting clip from Jarrett. Out to score LeBron, not to mention himself, some legacy points in his climb to the top as one of the best wing and perimeter defenders on the planet, this merely turned 24-year-old phenom of a clamp artist out of the University of Kentucky made a statement to the NBA universe about how annoying yet intelligent his perimeter defense can be. Aside from a possession down the stretch which is coming up, the Lakers mostly played regular one-on-one -on -one defense throughout this one, aside from the occasional trap, in addition to regular drop coverage in pick and rolls. The drop coverage I thought wouldn't have any chance in my LeBron and Steph preview for this one, but kudos to Darvin for going with it anyway, which seemed to shock Curry. Meanwhile, not only was Dennis Schroeder amazing with his defense on Steph, but the menace lived up to his nickname offensively as well, the man's aggressive quicks were tough for the Warrior guards to handle, as Dennis was showing off his overwhelming first step to get to the line and generally downhill. But maybe the story of this series, the leadership from Bronny Sr. outdoing Steph for the first time Curry's been outdone by an opposing top player in the leadership department in a long time. This may have been shell-shocking for Curry to see his fellow top player not just outclass him in terms of leadership, but be the most dominant player on both ends of the court. Now, you're going to respond with deep low, but Steph scored five more points than him, and James was also inefficient, in fact, even less efficient than Steph in this one. But listen, while LeBron Raymond James Sr. did only have 22, this man doesn't have quiet 20-plus point games. If anything, he makes them seem like 40-plus point games. Aside from down the stretch, it was a quiet 27 for Steph, and maybe the loudest 22-point night from James of his entire career. Whether it was the King's poised body language, his aggressiveness, 
to be willing to attack the restricted area, to embrace contact. This man inflicts his will on the game with his combination of stature and ball handling by itself. Terrifying part is, that's only one part of the equation for James, because if there's one thing about LeBron that went completely under-talked about, either in my series preview or previous Laker uploads from the entirety of the second half of the season and first round, ever since their trade deadline acquisitions of course, it was his ferociously intimidating prime Miami Heat, Cleveland Cavalier-esque athletic intensity on defense. His hops from the higher powers and 7-foot wingspan paired with his hand-eye coordination and wanting it more than you type desire to track down every bit of rim penetration or any slasher around the bucket in general is a nightmarish one-two punch for attackers. LeBron's funneling of perimeter attackers mixed with the top shot blocking inside that AD of course already provides combined to give the Lakers seven blocked shots in game one. And while it's of course a long series, that type of effort on defense may end up being overwhelming for a Draymond fanboy of LeBron-infused warrior locker room. As many people say, the NBA is just better when teams like the Knicks and Lakers are good, and with the vicious firepower of this Lakers squad around its two luminaries in Anthony Davis and LeBron James, whether it's shot-creating assassins in D'Angelo Russell or Austin AR-15 Reeves, or the smoothness of the perfect from the field in Game 1 Rui Hachimura, the spacing provided by Troy Brown Jr., Darvin Ham just has bodies on top of bodies at his disposal in the rotation. Quite frankly, it's a deeper and more talented group 1-15 through 15 than the Dubs, and I was aware of that coming into this series. As much experience as the Warriors have as a whole, LeBron Raymond James Sr knows the ins and outs of the industry better than anyone in the game. The underlying themes, the jealous haters, the passionate diehards, the greedy snarkiness from certain talking heads from one day to the next. For quite literally decades, the IQ both on and off the court has both seen through the weaknesses of the media, the fans, not to mention his opponents, and that's intimidating as hell for said opponents in addition to opposing fan bases. Given he renamed my hometown city of Toronto to Lebronto, whether I like it or not, I've gotten to know how LBJ operates. I know, and maybe you know, his mental control over the game bred by his physical implementing acumen is coming, but that doesn't mean you can stop it. In terms of his mental and physical control over a basketball game, LeBron dominates with that in the same way Steph dominates with his three-point shooting, how Mike or Kobe dominated with their fadeaways, or how Shaq dominated with his mere force. LeBron's dominance in terms of leadership and combined physical slash mental prominence over the outcome of any given ball game has so far proved to be the most sustainable dominating factor of them all. If AD stands or AD himself is watching, wanted to note I'll have another Laker video tomorrow breaking down film, so that's why he's not getting as much attention as you maybe would have assumed. But lastly, from a coaching perspective, I thought there could have been a timeout called by Darvin Ham when the Warriors went on a 14-0 run. I was actually wondering if the Lakers had any timeouts remaining. That's how confused I was about there not being a timeout called. D'Lo did airball a shot after it was initially an 11-0 run, but then he put the Lakers back up by four with a lay-in shortly after that, going back to Darvin, and he made up for any potential mistake by throwing a timely double at Curry on the final possession, and it was also a great job by Darvin to actually call a timeout right as Dennis Schroeder hustled for a loose ball and right before a jump ball was going to be called, gaining LA a crucial possession down the stretch. Overall, all of the defensive MVP on the night, Vando, the rim protection of AD, LeBron Raymond James Sr. getting nearly two chase down blocks in a row on Steph, combined with Dennis the Menace, would work for the most part, at least on a consistent basis, to blow up the Warriors advanced offense and ultimately control the flow.